Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel. There's a special guest today. It's actually a friend of the channel, Richard Simcott from the Polyglot Conference. Where are you today, Richard? Hello there. I am in a very cold and wet and windy Chester at the moment. Um, my hope was to walk around the city and show you the beautiful sights of our lovely Roman heritage. But unfortunately, I'm in a car in a car park in Tesco's. So not quite so um, romantic and exciting and dramatic as I'd hoped. <laughs> Whenever I'm recording things for the channel, you can bet nine times out of ten, because the weather's the same down here in London, that I'm struggling with the lighting and there's a dark, dismal sky outside. So yeah. um, it's the same down here. But there you go, folks. That's that's February in the UK. Now, talking of February in the UK, Richard, there's an event coming up. I introduce you as the Polyglot Conference guy. But... Uh, you have, or you're involved in a, another event which is coming up, which is called the Edinburgh Language Event. Richard, yeah. what's the what's the elevator pitch for, for about this? And what is it, and who's it for? Okay, so the language event is a series of language events that are happening or have been happening around the world. Started in, last year in Australia. So I was approached at the end of the Polyglot Gathering in Bratislava by a couple of groups of people. Uh, one group from Melbourne and, uh, and well, not Melbourne, actually from Australia, Brisbane and Auckland in New Zealand, asking if we could do some sort of language event there. And then at the same time, there was a group who were interested in bringing something back to Scotland, following on from an, um, a less formal event that occurred there last year. And um, they wanted to basically have a similar type of event, like a mini conference. And I thought, do you know what, why don't we just call it the language event and have one in Melbourne, which we did last year, which went really, really well. And then we're taking it now to Edinburgh. So we're having the language event Edinburgh uh, on the 29th of February and the 1st of March. So just a couple of weeks away. And we've got a great lineup of people. The idea is basically a mini conference um, style thing where we have a maximum, really, we're not looking at huge numbers of people, um, small venue. Uh, more intimate setting, but um, same kind of fun stuff with great people around to uh, celebrate languages, which we all love. So this has grown out of the informal event that uh, Maureen Millward and Gary McCann put on last year, which I attended and I vlogged from, I take it. So they're sort of uh, partnering on the ground with you, are they, helping you organise? Exactly, yeah. yeah. So Ma Maureen and, and Gary are working on it with me. And um, it's good to have local partners, you know, the same as um, in... In, in Melbourne, I had local partners too. And um, this year, you know, it's really, it, it wouldn't be possible without, without help on the ground. So, so yeah, they've been helping with that. And um, we've got a great lineup of people, you know, some, some really interesting people coming to talk about what we're celebrating really, which is the languages of the Isles. Um, and that's our main theme and our main fo focus for the event. So we'll be looking at not just sort of your, you're, you know, the first things that people come to people's minds really when you talk about the languages of the Isles are the Celtic languages, which of course you and I are both huge fans of. Um, you know, you've got your Welsh, you've got your Manx, you've got your Irish, you've got your Gaelic, um, but also beyond that, maybe Cornish as well, hopefully, Matt, you know, but um, hopefully um, we're going to just sort of tease out some things I think that are overlooked in our Isles, and that's the Scots language. Um, I think very often um you know it suffered with uh you know the, the classical english dominates and it's you've got scottish english that's spoken as a variation of english which is obviously a recognized way of speaking english um the same way as american english or different types of american english would be recognized and scottish english exists as its own little thing but um but scots as a language i mean it's got its own roots its own history and i think deserves to be celebrated in a similar way and you know, to try and move past this whole idea of you're speaking bad English. It's that whole sort of thing that's been forced onto, I think, a number of families that spoke Scots, and quite rightly so, is its own is its own language, its own thing. It's been sort of categorised as a as a dialect of English uh, by many. And and okay, I mean, I, I understand that for many English native English speakers, native Scottish English speakers too, but because it, there's an understandability there, and we're not used to that as native English speakers, it's easy to say, okay, you understand it, therefore it's a type of dialect. 
In fact, in the rest of Europe, you know, this is a really common thing. You know, Norwegians, Swedes, Danes, you can kind of have a conversation together, especially Norwegians and Swedes. You can have a fairly good conversation together. I mean, my ho own home language of Macedonian, we can speak to Serbs, we can speak to Bulgarians, almost no problem whatsoever. Some may argue that they're similar or the same language, but the fact that they're similar and you have mutual intelligibility doesn't necessarily mean that the sort of the line is so blurred that you you start calling it the same language. Other speakers are used to it, as native English speakers were not, and I think it's a good thing to investigate and to look into and to, to celebrate that linguistic diversity we have in these beautiful isles, even though they are very rain, rainy and windy at the moment. <laughs> beautiful in any weather. So one of the speakers you've got talking about Scots is uh, a lady called Frida Morrison I saw on the programme. Mm -hmm who was talking about broadcasting in Scots. So there are broadcasts yep. in the language uh, nowadays. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things I really liked, I mean, if you listen to her, 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 her broadcast, actually, she did an interview with Maureen. And um, just from listening to that, I then started listening to more of the interviews that she'd done. And I really loved this idea of teasing out the the real Scots turns of phrase, phrases that you get and the real Scots words that you kind of don't normally hear. Um, I mean, as a, as a child, I used to listen to Rabsy Nesbitt at home. It was a very popular comedy uh, thing from, from Scotland and used a lot of Scots in that. And um, and so I was always quite, quite sort of unsurprised that people would see it as a different language. I remember one time when I was at university, I was watching Rab Nesbitt and I had subtitles on for a, um, a friend of mine from the Caribbean because I was watching it without subtitles uh, from the north of the UK. You tend to understand Scots a lot more readily and easily than people from the south, for example, just because obviously proximity and we had a lot more um, sort of going on, going up there and, and mixing with people and hearing more people from Scotland coming down. Um, but I remember him coming in and he goes, which language are you listening to now? He couldn't understand a word of it. And I said, well, it's um, yeah, from Scotland. <laughs> and he went, no. And then I put the subtitles on and he could start following it because of the, sub the help of the subtitles. But um, it was, for me, it wasn't surprising at all that this, this language with, with its richness and also these interesting turns of phrase and its own unique vocabulary. Um, it's also super interesting. And to hear Frida talk about that on her radio show, and to, to really delve into the, the depths of how their, their grandparents or great grandparents used to speak and sort of bring them back to the fore. Um, super interesting. Uh, a sort of another sort of sub theme I saw looking at the programme, which maybe links this up, is, you know, the impact of technology on language communities as well. So we're talking very much about the physical isles, the British isles, but also how technology can create new communities. So Michael Dempster is talking on cyber Scots to keep with the theme of Scots for a moment. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, you know, in terms of the Isles and, and the languages we speak, um, I think that, you know, it, you can't sort of go away from what's happening online, the online community, uh, the technology and the, the sort of tools that we have. And I think, you know, it's good to sort of bring things up to the modern age. And I think this is why these kinds of discussions now are possibly, um, sort of better done in those kinds of contexts. So yeah, I mean, I'm really pleased to see that he did a great TED talk on this topic of Scots and, um, you know, about him learning these words at home and then going to school and finding out that, you know, his hoos wasn't his hoos. Um, it was a house in, in standard uh, English and having to learn these words again almost and having but I loved his description of having a box of, of English words that he'd have at home. And um, yeah, uh, doing that in a modern age, especially if, you know, we've got, you know, like our sponsors for the Polyglot Conference, Memorize, obviously they use this kind of technology in terms of cards to, to learn the words. <laughs> and uh, maybe, you know, we can, we can sort of better assimilate this kind of vocabulary again. Um, into our common day parlance from the older days. I liked the phrase which you have in the title of another talk, uh, digital homelands. Uh, there's mm -hmm. a talk about Ladino, which as I understand it is the Jewish language from Spain, which I know you take an interest in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, Ladino, I think particularly strikes a chord with me because it was a language that was spoken 
in um, in Skopje, uh, which is obviously a city that's very important to me. Um, and unfortunately, it's a language that if you ask most common day Macedonians now, most sort of nowadays in Macedonia, if you ask most people in, in, in that region of the world, whether it's the Macedonia of Greece, the Macedonia of Bulgaria, the Macedonia of North Macedonia, you would honestly uh, rarely come across somebody who actually knows the language and yet it was a language that was spoken quite vibrantly um, you know within our grandparents time um, and obviously disappeared the advent of the second world war so it's not um, linked to spain particularly then i sort of had in my head a link with spain it was so originally the language was spoken in spain by the jewish community of spain and portugal um, and then they were expelled uh, 500 or so years ago okay, and yeah. they were accepted into the Ottoman Empire and in the Ottoman Empire um, some of their main hubs would have been Thessaloniki in Greece um, also Sarajevo which they called Sarai which um, means palace in uh, in Turkish and um, they so they were spoken and there were, as I say, vi quite vibrant languages in these hubs. Uh, Skopje was one of those places where it was spoken as a language, um, not as big a centre for the language as Thessaloniki and Sarajevo, I don't believe. Um, but still, it was a language that was used in the city. And unfortunately, it's all but gone in many of these places. And it shifted over to where I think probably the biggest hub now is Istanbul. Um, there are speakers, obviously, in, in now what is uh, now Israel, um, but they're also in Istanbul, too. And I went to the synagogue in Istanbul to listen to presentations in Ladino after I studied it for a little bit of time myself. Um, I find the language, and as you probably remember from the Polyglot Conference in Thessaloniki, we had uh, Karen Zorn from, um, from Istanbul come over to talk about Ladino. And um, yeah, so it's a language that's close to my heart and I yeah really I like that we got another topic on this for for this event and I thought it was quite nice to mix something a bit different into um, you know the, the the main theme of the languages of the Isles. So yeah, talking about history there are several talks which seem to have an historical theme now there's one speaker you've got to help me out here uh, history with Hilbert uh, what's all this about? Well you know what I was going around on YouTube as you do and um, all of a sudden this history with Hilbert appeared as a channel for me to so suggested viewing on YouTube and I thought I'd never heard of him and I wanted to see what all this was about so I clicked on his videos and saw all these things these links to old English and the sort of the languages of the the Isles as well and I just thought what a great person to bring into our language community fold <laughs> and that was kind of where that started so I just started writing to him and and said look you know we're having this event in in Edinburgh if you're in the UK it would be great if you could make it up and um and yeah and he agreed so um I was very very pleased because I thought it's always good to bring somebody who's kind of sort of an outlier of of the language, but also bringing the historical aspect of things. And and yeah, and I just thought brilliant uh, way to bring extra people into the community. Uh, so that's really the story behind that. And um, I do like to try and find people, you know, who are sort of the, the, where their circles. You, I always imagine this Venn diagram of the language the community where we we overlap into different areas, and we always get these comments. Um, at different conferences and on our channels of why you just talk about language learning about languages why don't you actually talk about other things and this is where these kinds of things do overlap you know history everything basically overlaps with language um, and and this is another reason why again um, Serene Saran is coming back to talk about multilingualism and autism because I, I feel that these topics really do have this sort of overlapping interest into the field that we all love of languages and language learning and um, they're a great way to celebrate it and to also bring new minds and new ideas into the mix and um, I'm all for that really. And she's talking about uh, how memory works, the executive function and then you've got Thomas Beck uh, who is uh, one of the local organisers who I remember speaking at the Polyglot Conference in Reykjavik who is a great mm -hmm. speaker uh, also talking, I suppose, about neuro-linguistics uh, and language or something like that. Yeah, I mean, these topics are always fascinating. I just, I, I've got to be honest, sometimes when I when I look at people speaking and I, I talk to speakers and I look at the proposals, 
a little bit of me is like, you know, I'd really love to hear about that myself. And I think if I want to hear about it, I'm sure that there are going to be others that want to too. Um, you know, I did this with the Polygot conference in Fukuoka as well. And, um, you know, I got some really good feedback on the ones that I knew that I specifically wanted to have speak. Um, because it can be a bit of a, a bit of an issue when you're, you know, you're, you're putting together these events. We do have quite often the same people who want to speak and they've got a lot to say it's then also you've got to make room as well for these new people to come in and to just diversify things a little bit i think it's really really important and um, i'm really pleased that we get these smaller events now that allow us this ability to really celebrate new and different languages and this year uh, as the polyglot conference i'm really proud to say that we're supporting this 100% and bringing our film crew from the Polyglot Conference to Edinburgh to have all of these professionally recorded and edited so that we'll have all the presentations available for you online free of charge as we do the Polyglot Conference year on year. On the history side then, coming back to that, uh, a couple of talks which struck me as definitely ones I want to hear were Mark Atherton talking about what did Old English or Anglo-Saxon sound like, and then Tony Fakete as well, talking about yeah. language learning books in the 18th and 19th century and the interplay with identity and uh, national regional identities. Two really fascinating yeah. talks. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, Tony's somebody who's been with the community for a long, long time. I've actually... Um, and I don't think we've ever had him speak at any of the events yet. So uh, when when he wrote to say that he'd be interested in talking, I was obviously very, very excited because I think, as I said, you know, getting someone who's simply been on the peripheries or not sort of been you know, head on going and giving talks, I think is really, really a good opportunity for us to hear uh, a new perspective, a new point of view and, and new um, sort of ways of looking at the language community, but also um their experiences, which are obviously unique to them. Uh, so every time we get the chance of a new voice, I'm, I'm thrilled. Um, in terms of the Old English, yeah, of course, I mean, it's really exciting because, you know, Old English is kind of the birthplace for the Germanic languages and the Germanic dialects on 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 the Isles. So really, really cool to hear that. And, and obviously, you know, Mark is a sort of a real I'd say the pinnacle of what he does, you know, uh, in terms of Old English uh, research and studies. So having him talk and being the author of uh, Teach Yourself Old English, also really exciting stuff. And Teach Yourself, also, uh, you know, a, a sponsor of this event and, and a sponsor of the Polyglot Conference uh, for a while now. Uh, really great to have their input and their buy-in on an event like this. And I mean, and year on year, actually, I, I do look to my sponsors uh, for for all the events to give me some good ideas for the you know talks that we can have on the program um, and I'm really grateful to them for all their contributions. Asi Neil has been absolutely brilliant in this with the conferences. Uh, teach yourself as well and also I mean this year in, in or last year in Fukuoka I should say now we're in a new year. Um, we also had you know Italki and Memorize uh, giving talks themselves and um, this was just really really good valuable uh you know, sort of gems that we got uh for for the events before we talk about language learning richard uh let's just talk a bit about the celtic language side uh, i'm mm -hmm. sure you won't need any encouragement on the program so you've got uh simon ager from omniglot talking about celtic connections the relationship yeah. between the languages uh you also have uh somebody talking about teaching Irish, I think, um, teaching yes. the Irish language. Yes, uh, in fact, uh, Pat has written, I think she wrote the uh, Teach Yourself Irish course. So this is Patricia uh, McCorn, yes, I think. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, exactly. And so she has also been involved in some other um, Irish learning um, resources. So there is a link there actually from the site, I believe, on the, on the website that you can have a look through and, and see. Um, she came highly recommended, in fact, as a really engaging speaker, someone who uh, got a lot of very positive feedback at previous events. So I was keen, obviously, to have Irish represented. You know, as one of the languages of the Isles, I think that it's important that we try and represent as many of those languages as possible. I think the only one that we're missing at the moment is Cornish. 
Um, but of course, I hope that that will be included in uh, in Simon's talk yes. um, yeah. as one of the languages he studied. Um, but otherwise, we, we do. We have a, a very good representation of, of, I think, the bulk of the languages that we speak on these lovely isles. <laughs> and Christopher Lowing is talking about the revival of Manx. I know Simon Eger is, uh, has learnt Manx, so uh, yeah. I'm not sure I've come across Christopher before, but uh, is he a friend mm. of yours or, again, somebody who uh, you found on the internet? Or <laughs> So, again, he came recommended to me um, by some Manx contacts who, who run Manx courses on the Isle of Man and, uh, and, and work quite a lot in that community and so um i was really really pleased when when i was introduced to him because um you know i i really would like to see manx um sort of represented and also because the work that they've done with manx has been actually really amazing <laughs> yes you know sort of you, you get um a native speaker who you believe is or, or was sort of lauded to be the last speaker of manx dying out but actually wasn't um it was i believe still is probably true but i'm again there are people who would dispute this the last native speaker of the language who who died in i believe 1972 um don't quote me but i believe that's right uh, definitely in the 70s um but there were very fluent speakers who were still around and what they've done is they've they've done so much good work in keeping the language alive on the island uh, so the language did not go extinct it did not die out as was uh, reported in fact it, there was a huge revival of it. it was setting up the school on the island uh, as a manx medium school and now having over a thousand or i don't know how many speakers of the language who are native native level speakers uh, of manx and um, there are definitely native speakers of manx to this day in modern day isle of man so um, having somebody represent that would be fantastic and um, really, really pleased. And talking about language revival, you've got uh, Adam O'Broin, I'm not sure how you pronounce that, talking about a Strathclyde Gaelic, I think. So uh, he's a one, yeah. is that right? Is it Strathclyde? I'm not sure. He's a one man language revival machine. <laughs> Absolutely. And I mean, you know, in his work on obviously the Outlander series, which is very, very popular uh, on Netflix and just on general TV, I think. Um, obviously, he wrote those uh, pieces in Gaelic that were for that series. So, you know, he's done a lot uh, of good work and work that's been popularised by that series, particularly uh, where people have heard Gaelic probably for a number of people around the world for the first time. Um, and that's all down to him. So having someone like that come to speak at the event again. I mean, this is a small event, but look at the names, look at the work that they've done. You know what I mean? It feels, I'm almost like I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy <laughs> coming to this. You yourself, you're an inspiration to me. I mean, you know, you know, the things that you've done with Welsh, I mean, going there as a learner and then teaching through the medium of Welsh, Gareth, you know, hats off. It's uh, no small feat, you know, to do something like that. So. I'm really pleased and proud that you're able to to represent Welsh. Yes, well, yeah, I will be speaking on exactly that topic, folks. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, indeed. So it's a fascinating programme. And uh, I suppose, um, who would the target audience member be? So if someone's looking at this and thinking, mm, I, you know, I can get to Edinburgh um, at this time at the end of, it's what, the 29th of February, the 1st of yeah. March... Uh, yeah. Who would the ideal attendee be? Would this be something for me, as it were, if one was watching? Who would um, who would that be? I, I, I would I would think that people who are interested in the languages of the Isles definitely. Yeah. Um, if you're interested in the sort of diversity that we have on these Isles, there are bits and bobs in for pretty much everyone. I think you know, with the sort of the neurolinguistic angle, with the the autism type angle, there's, there are people that you can interact with on so many different levels um, that I think it works for a lot of people, a very broad audience. We also have the language learning panel, which um, at the end, we, that's we, the very end. Yeah, isn't it? yeah, exactly. So we do on the second day at the end of the day, we have a language learning panel, people talking about things that work to learn languages. So there is a sort of a practical element to it. Um, it was going to be a bigger element to the to the actual event in the, in the sort of beginnings of putting it together. Um, but what I found was um, I just got so many great topics on the languages of the Isles that I just felt I couldn't cut it down. 
and I couldn't choose between um, these other topics. So I decided a panel was probably the best way to go. And also it allowed people the chance to sort of ask questions and interact as well. Um, so that's the reason why it ended up the way it did in the programme. And I hope that that works for everybody. I believe it will. Um, and yeah, as I say, I think I think this this is an event really for anybody with any interest in in our real linguistic diversity on these beautiful aisles. Uh, yeah. And I would say, you know, from my own experience of these events, they're always extremely welcoming. So if you have the interest yeah, yeah. and the enthusiasm, don't be shy of getting a ticket and coming along and talking about getting tickets, Richard. How would people do that? So it's just literally you type into Google the language event Edinburgh. <laughs> You're going to find the website and you'll find the link. It's very simple. It's also there's a page on Facebook, too, uh, that you can like and join. Um, so the language event and then there's a group, the language event Edinburgh, and you can join and find tickets really easily. I, do, I should say, to be fair, there's probably only about 10 spaces we can accommodate now because we're pretty much sold out. Um, uh, as I say, it's a small event. It's uh, the venue isn't big enough for us to hold a large number of people. Tickets have sold really well. And um, and yeah, as I say, it's uh, we have to keep the numbers down just because of space. Um, yeah. So what sort of size are we talking about? You know, um, I think we can get about 80 people in. Yeah. So yeah. we're almost at that already. Yes. Um, so if people do want to do it, act quickly so that you make sure you do get your ticket. Um, but there won't be many left. Uh, to be fair and um, if you don't get a ticket this time hopefully next time or watch things online watch um, things online yes that's the that's yes. the other alternative and uh, that will be on the polyglot conference youtube channel i suppose yeah i'll yeah. put them on there for now and um, and then we'll see whether or not we we develop it as a completely separate thing but for now it will be on there as the polyglot conference is sponsoring the filming of it um but also i should say actually if you do get to go to one of these events the advantages of doing that as opposed to going online, the online thing is great because you get the content, but you can never sort of make up for that. As you know, Gareth, that in-person contact, you make friends for life at these events and also the time to talk to people who are just wealth of knowledge on language learning and languages. And you can just ask questions that, that doing so online is, is a little bit trickier to do. Absolutely. That is my experience. And that's true, of course, of the Polyglot Conference, too. As we wind up, just briefly look ahead to that. That's going to be in uh, Mexico this year. It is in Cholula. And we are so proud and so happy to be uh, co you know, coordinating efforts with uh, the Langfest team, who usually are in Montreal in Canada. And they're going to be joining us in Cholula for the week before the conference. So the conference actually is on the 16th to the 18th. Uh, to the Friday, Saturday, Sunday of October. Uh, but the, the days before, um, we're going to be having Langfest events too. And um, we're super, super happy about that. Cholula, I just got back from there um, about a week ago. Amazing. The venue is fantastic. Um, the city is just really, really nice. I can't even express in words how much I think people are going to enjoy it. Um, so many great places to explore and to enjoy as groups, big groups, small groups, bars, restaurants, cafes, you name it. Um, it's all there. Puebla, the city that's sort of, it's the fourth largest city in Mexico, which I didn't realize, shame on me, uh, is a 15 minute Uber ride from Cholula Center, really close by. So if you're staying, you can stay there as well. Great city. I didn't know how beautiful it was really nice as well so um just two two amazing places and then also there's all the other amazing places in mexico super easy to get to from the airport super simple people are wonderful um and you can learn noatl or improve your spanish or do a bit of both or whatever else takes your fancy who knows <laughs> So that's one to look forward to. And maybe you'd come on again once the programme's been put together, you know, Absolutely. sometime in the summer or, and tell us about that. But coming back to Edinburgh then, uh, I suppose you'd be rather more confident guaranteeing the weather in Mexico than in Edinburgh at the end of the month. <laughs> Absolutely. I think Edinburgh, yeah, bring your long johns, <laughs> bring your thermals. Um, it's not going to be hot, but it'll be a warm atmosphere inside. <laughs> well, that's a great way to finish. I'm looking forward to it, Richard. Thanks very much for taking the time to tell us about the programme. 
folks, the link will be underneath this video. And yeah, thanks for um, for calling by. See you. See you soon, Richard. Thank you. See you soon. Bye bye. Bye. <laughs> <Okay>. Great. <laughs>